Well, hello, Y Church family and friends. Welcome to part two of our message that we started on Sunday. We're calling it the extraordinary way to experience blessing. And as you remember from Sunday, I just could not get through the scheduled text that we had. So we don't usually do a midweek message like this, but uh, it just seemed like the best way to approach the text. I hope you have your Bible with you. That can be a hard copy or on your phone. And you're going to meet us in 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we're going to pick it up again. We're going to actually hear from Gail West this second half of the reading in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to just set the stage quick with a little recap of what we did on Sunday. We were in 1 Peter 3, 8 through 12. That's the first half of this whole passage that really stretches all the way to verse 22. And in verse 8, we have this lead-off sentence that shapes the whole thing, and Peter gives us five characteristics of a life fully submitted to God. Peter says, finally, all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. And I had each of those five first letters on my fingers to help me remember, like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble. And then Peter showed us some application of that in a specific kind of way. And he said in verse 9, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. And we talked about how extraordinary this is. To, to live like this is not normal. You know, when I'm wronged, when I am attacked or insulted, that I would not retaliate or fight back or, you know, at a a minimum, ignore the other person. No, I'm called to actually bless them. This is an extraordinary thing that Christ has called us to, to repay evil with blessing. And we talked about the many opportunities that we have, especially this year, to practice exactly this kind of thing coronavirus, back to school, election year. Um, This is an extraordinary way to live in this season in a way that walks in the blessing of God, um, that we get to do this because he already has given us every blessing in heaven. So we've got an inheritance coming that we don't deserve, but God has called us blessed in Christ. And so we get to share that with others. That's the idea that's now developed in the second half of the passage and that I'm going to develop with us in the message. So let's jump to Gail, who's going to do the scripture reading for us, verses 13 to 22. We're in 1 Peter 3, 13 to 22. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits. To those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. All right. Thanks, Gail, for doing our scripture reading again this week. Even though we cut it in half, you know, there is still a lot that's here. And some of it gets pretty mysterious. In fact, when it comes to that 
part about imprisoned spirits and Noah and the ark, uh, Martin Luther, who was one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church, said, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. And if Martin Luther couldn't figure it out, well, that doesn't bode too well for us. But here's what I'll say about our approach today. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a, a favorite line of a preacher that I know. He says, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. So we're gonna major on the main things, the things that are plain to us. And we are gonna leave the finer theological points for another day. Uh, if you do have questions or curiosities about uh, some of those things in this passage, by all means, just let me know, and I'd love to chat with you about it. It's really good stuff. We would just be here for a long time if we tried to do it all inside this message. So for our purposes today, I've got a simple outline that will take us through the passage. The main thing is this. Here's what Peter wants us to know, that if you suffer for following Christ, you are blessed. I'll say it again. If you suffer for following Christ, you are blessed by God, period. That's the big point he's trying to make. And then there's three responses that we get to live out in response to that truth. And I'm going to reveal those as we go. But first, a little more about the main thing, that if you suffer for following Christ, you are blessed. In verse 13, Peter says that when you belong to God, Basically, you've got nothing to lose. In verse 13, he says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? And what he means there is, who can ultimately do you any harm if you are living out the goodness of God? If you belong to Christ and your eternal home is in heaven, then what on this earth can actually do any harm to you? Paul puts it in another way in Romans 8, 31, when he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And remember, whether it's Paul writing to the Romans or here it's Peter writing to, to Christians in Turkey, they're writing to people who are, in fact, experiencing flat-out persecution. These people are being harmed. That was their situation. They were in harm's way every day because they believed in Christ. And so Peter says to them in verse 14, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. That reminds me of those three guys in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're threatened with the fiery furnace if they do not bow down to this gold image, this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they say to him, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold. I think those even if statements are so powerful. But even if you should suffer for following Christ, make no mistake about it, you are blessed. And then in the text, we get to the first of our three responses to that truth. The, the first thing that Peter says is, don't be afraid. Second half of verse 14, Peter is alluding to Isaiah chapter 8, and, and he says, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. Now in Isaiah, when that's originally said, the people of God are about to be attacked by not just one, but actually two enemy nations who have allied against them. In First Peter, we've got these scattered believers who are being badgered and beaten for their faith. They're losing their property, losing their jobs, in some cases, losing their lives. Now, you and I, as we apply this to our own lives, we're not facing the same thing where we live in our time and place. But we do recognize that our culture continues to move decisively away from Christ and away from a biblical worldview. And so you might find yourself wondering, you know, what kind of world are my children or grandchildren going to live in? What will it be like for them to follow Jesus? What will it be like to, to live under the authority of God's word in their day? We do know this, 
that it, is, it has not been the historical norm for Christ followers to have it easy. And it is, in fact, the norm to be the minority view, to be publicly maligned and to swim against the tide. One of the reasons that we're planting a church and building a YMCA in India is that in a country of 1.37 billion people, four times the size of the U.S., there are only 2.3% who follow Jesus. The persecution theme of 1 Peter is very real to many of them. And yet even for us, we recognize the spiritual battle that we are in, and it can be a fearful thing to follow Jesus. So what fears do you have as you seek to be faithful? What foothold does fear have as it is trying to access your life? Where would Satan be whispering in your ear, see, look at the hard time that you're having. Surely God has turned his back on you. I just encourage you to slam the door on those kinds of messages and to speak the truth. God's word says that even if you suffer for following Christ, you are blessed by God and have nothing to fear. So number one is don't be afraid. And then the second response Peter has for us is revere Christ. Revere Christ. Verse 15 says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. I think revere is a good English rendering, but the actual word that's there is sanctify. Sanctify or, or consecrate Christ in your heart. Set him apart from everything else. Now, we say this in the Lord's Prayer when we say, hallowed be thy name. And Peter says, revere Christ as Lord. Give him the most prominent place in your heart. You know, confessing Jesus as Lord is not just giving mental assent to it, uh, this rational decision that we make, but it means that you are placing the affections of your heart upon him. You're devoted to him at a heart level. And now we connect this to Peter's first imperative, that first response, and we see that a worshipful heart is one of the most effective ways for you to deal with fear. Don't be afraid. Instead, revere Christ as Lord. And then that thought's developed in the text. It says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. What a good word for us today. And isn't it interesting that it's Peter who writes this? And we remember Peter's story that he was the one in that outer courtyard who was asked three times if he knew Jesus and he couldn't bring himself to say yes. And here he is now on the other side of that experience saying, always be prepared to give an answer. The word answer is the Greek word apologia, and it's where we get our English word apologize. But the Greek meant something different than, than in English. Uh, the Greek meant uh, defense. So this was the word that was used in courtroom settings where someone would take the stand and give a, a formal defense. But Peter's admonition here is not just for formal occasions or Roman tribunals. This is a word to all of us who are following Christ. Are you able to give an answer to someone who is wondering why you believe in Jesus? Peter is, is assuming that there are compelling reasons that someone would choose to revere Christ as Lord. When you become a Christian, you don't check your mind at the door. Why do you believe? Could you share some of those reasons with a friend at school in casual conversation? Could you answer the questions of a curious colleague at work? Could you respond to the objections of a neighbor who's a skeptic? These aren't the questions of a courtroom. This is everyday life. In high school, I was going to miss a ball game for a student retreat at church one time. And I'll never forget having to go up and talk to the head coach and tell him in advance that, that I was going to be gone. There was not an ounce of amusement on his face when he looked at me and he said, are you telling me that church 
is more important than your commitment to this team. Uh, my wife, when she was in high school growing up in, in Germany, so different country, same kind of dynamic. She had a teacher say to her once, Esther, you are such a sharp student. I just don't understand why you would believe all this Christian stuff. What would you say? How would you respond? And could you do it with both conviction and respect? You know, Peter says that at the end of the verse. He says, but do this with gentleness and respect. The examples of defiant, combative Christianity abound. And it's really only magnified because our culture loves to find the most crass voices and caricature a picture of Christianity that's offensive. That is not the picture that Peter has in mind. He holds up a, a humility of life that is paired with the conviction of the truth. People will be offended at the gospel. Uh, that will happen. But may they take offense at the message when that happens and not the way that we share it. New York Times columnist David Brooks describes having decades of atheism unsettled by the magnetic pull of the many Christians who entered his life in one way or another. We need to hear more of those kind of stories. Can you make an articulate statement of the reasons you have for believing in Christ? And can you do it in a winsome way? You don't need to be a rocket scientist either to, to do this. You just need to be prepared. That's what Peter says. He was a fisherman. So he says to us, always be ready to give an answer. Be prepared. Study your Bible. Study the culture around you. And, and pray that God would give you the words that you need to be an effective witness for him. You might also find the area of Christian apologetics to be helpful in this regard. Uh, apologetics, there's that, that word again, apologia. And uh, this is the field of study that is describing the defense of the faith. I put a new book on my birthday wish list for this fall. I am 38 years old, but my mother still asks for a, a birthday list. And so I put this book on there that I was reading about earlier this year. It actually won a, a Book of the Year award, and it's the book called Confronting Christianity. And the author, Rebecca McLaughlin, then identifies 12 of the most commonly heard objections to Christianity on college campuses today. And then she responds to each of them with clarity, concision, and don't forget, compassion. And so maybe... Maybe that book is something that you want to study with me this fall. Uh, and I say this knowing full well the temptation that, that we have to isolate ourselves as Christians. I mean, there are days it can be, oh, we're just so weary of the world that we would like to just retreat and create this little Christian bubble that we can live in. You know, to hunker down with the people who believe the same things we do and think the way we do and turn our back on the world. But theologian Paul Ochtemeyer points out, cultural isolation is not to be the route taken by the Christian community. It is to live its life openly in the midst of the unbelieving world and just as openly to be prepared to explain the reasons for it. So don't be afraid. Revere Christ, Peter says. And then thirdly, remember the cross. Remember the cross. Verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Remember the, the main thing we said at the very beginning. If you suffer for following Christ, you are blessed. And here Peter is reminding his readers that Christ himself experienced suffering. We can take heart in our own suffering by remembering that our Savior suffered for us. On Sunday, we celebrated a couple baptisms after our outdoor service, and uh, we had Jessica and her mom, Donna, who were immersed in the waters of baptism there in the lake. And it was this, this picture of us dying to sin, being buried with Christ, and then raised up with him to newness of life. Peter says, this is the symbol of baptism that we are saved by the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. And there we got it. We come all the way back to submission. This whole thing comes full circle. What does a life look like that is fully submitted to God? It is a life that has received the resurrection power of Jesus and knows that even in our suffering, Christ has won the battle and we are abundantly blessed in him. My brothers and sisters, it is quite the year. It is a contentious time we're living in. And it feels like there's a lot on the line. Uh, marriages are stressed. Jobs are being lost and gained. The school year seems like one giant question mark. Uh, the resolve of our leaders is being tested. The resilience of our nation. We have an election in front of us and, and politics are front and center and often not pretty. But may the way that we live, may the way that we follow Jesus be a much needed breath of fresh air. Some will find Christ offensive, but others are just waiting to hear from you about how much they are loved, that the cross heals every wound, and that in Christ, we indeed have God's greatest blessing. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for suffering for our sake, for securing for us our eternal inheritance. And Lord, may that truth put everything else in our life in perspective. We ask, Lord, that you would keep us from fear. We ask that you would have the most prominent place in our hearts and that the victory of the cross would always be before us. We praise you, our risen Lord, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me for this midweek message. Looking forward to seeing you again on Sunday when we turn into chapter 4, 1 Peter. We'll see you then.